Hi, I'm John Farkara. Welcome to Farkara Classic. And today we are going deep on the history. And I mean deep geek. I mean 20,000 leagues under the sea. Deep geek. Why? Because I want to tell you about a car. It's one of my favorite from the 1960s. And you probably haven't heard of it. So you need the whole story on how it came to be. And that car is the ATS 2500 GT or GTS, the racing version. Now, most people have never heard of these cars. I never heard of these cars until one of them rolled into Canopy years ago, and I was like, is that a Ferrari? Nope, it's an ATS. I had to find out more, and I want to share that with you today. Now, in order to tell you the story of that car, I got to tell you the story of another period of time in order to lead up to it. So bear with me. We're going to talk about ATS, their Formula One car, and their street car, and how they came to be. Now, we'll start with Ferrari, as many things do in Italy. So Ferrari was the dominant race team. Enzo Ferrari was the dominant owner, and they won everything back in the 50s. Ferrari was known as a bit of a dick, tater, the way he ran his company. And um, after his son Dino died, he kind of started pulling back a little bit on attending races and being in the factory. And his wife, Laura, stepped in with the same kind of managerial style as, say, Benito Mussolini. And she got a little bit at odds with, oh, well, well, everybody, essentially. And finally, she really went head to head with Girolamo Gardini, who was the sales and business manager of Ferrari at the time. And he just couldn't take it anymore. And at some point, the story goes, she slaps him in front of some other people. And he had had it. So he went to Enzo and said, hey, I can't deal with this anymore. What are you going to do about your wife? And Enzo, in the way he dealt with things, says, nothing, none of your business. Uh, you can't quit. You're fired. And he fires him. On the spot, out the back door, goes Gardini. Now, that set off a ripple effect throughout Ferrari. The people there respected him and the way he had held things together. He was the buffer between Ferrari and everybody else. He took the abuse. Without him there, it was a very dangerous place to work. So a lot of them got together, eight men got together, and wrote a letter a really strongly worded letter, like really, you know, a letter is for you kids out there. It's like a text, except it's paper with a, with a pen. And they wrote him a letter saying, listen, we don't agree with what you've done. Uh, can we, you know, maybe resolve this? Here was the resolution. Enzo Ferrari calls them into a meeting, not about the letter, about business as usual. It's a short meeting, about 45 minutes. And then he leaves. And then his secretary comes in and strangles them all to death. No, I'm just kidding. This is Ferrari, not the Mafia. Um, what she does do is hands them all an envelope with one month's pay and tells them to get the heck out. And that was it. Now, this wasn't eight guys who were like sweeping the floors. This was his lead team. This was Giotto Bizzarini, who was in charge of the sports cars and experimental cars at the time, a real brilliant man. Carlo Chitti, who was his chief engineer, who had designed the shark nose Ferrari and designed engines for him and was absolutely brilliant. And Romolo Tavoni, who was the team captain for the Scuderia. These heads of departments are all gone. Ferrari eliminates them all. And this is not a great time for Ferrari to be eliminating those people because, you know, you've got the British car teams, uh, BRM and Lotus coming strong in Formula One. You've got you know, uh, eventually Lamborghini, who he hacked off as well, will start making sports cars in spite of him, and Ford's gonna wanna take him out. Like, things are a little bit edgy. And it's also, it's so strange, because this was such a golden era for Ferrari. 1961, when this happened, they had won the Formula One championship with Phil Hill driving. They had won Le Mans. They had won the sports car championship. They were on top of the world. You know, you think you would have kept the team that did all that for you, but no, poof, out the door they go. Now, none of these gentlemen expected to be out of work. So it's not like they had anything planned <laughs> to go do. This was October, late October, 1961. And over the next few months, Gardini 
spoke to a few friends, and people got together. They had heard about this. Obviously, it was it was called the Great Walkout or the Palace Revolt. It had or the Night of the Long Knives for Ferrari. They called it, and it was big news. So a few people stepped in. Uh, Gardini's friend Count Volpi. So Giovanni Volpi was this 24-year-old kid. Uh, he had his own race team, the Scuderia Ceramissima, and you know he had bought Ferraris. He was racing Ferraris and Maseratis. He's like, I could have my own team of Ferrari people? This sounds interesting. And he brought in another gentleman named Jamie Patizortino, who was known as the Tin King of Bolivia, right? And a professional bridge player to boot. So he wanted to put in some money. And finally, Keedy brought in a friend of his, Giorgio Billy, who was an industrialist in uh, that area. He was very, very wealthy because he had mechanized the making of stockings. And in the 50s and 60s, stockings were a huge thing. He had patents. He was the real industrialist of the three. So th they brought these three guys together and they said, hey, let's form a new team, the Anti-Ferrari. And so they did. And in February 1962, Automobilia Turismo Esport, ATS, was born in Bologna, Italy. Now, what do you do? You've got all these amazing, talented gentlemen. You've got a lot of money. How do you attack Ferrari? Well, Ferrari's famous for they race and they sell streetcars. The streetcars help support the race car division. So they're going to build a Formula One car and a streetcar that they can also sports car race. This is pretty bold. From scratch, they're going to build these things. They don't have a factory. They don't have anything. They just have a lot of talent. So they set about building a factory, which the first brick of that doesn't happen until August of 1962. So they get a little office in Bologna, and they have a little kind of a shack. They're, they start building the cars in. Bizzarini's in charge of the road car, and Keedy's in charge of the, well, everything, but also the Formula One car. And uh, I'll tell you first about the Formula One car. Because what happens is Keedy really wants to go after Ferrari. Of, the, of all of them, he's the one who's like hell-bent on making this happen. So he wants to go after where Ferrari lives, and that's Formula One. Now, Keedy had designed the Shark Nose, which had won the Formula One championship in 1961. He had built the V6 engine that was in it. So he had all the capabilities. He probably had all these engineering dreams he wanted to do. And over the years, had taken so much abuse from Ferrari. He was like, I'm going to unleash all of this. And we're going to find out what that is. Now, what that turned out to be was <laughs> the ATS 100. Was it a great Formula One car? No, but uh, you got to remember, you're usually in the manufacturing of race cars and regular cars, you're usually working on the car that's coming out a couple years from now. Now, you have things in the pipeline. They had nothing in the pipeline and they couldn't copy Ferrari. Keedy really wanted to make sure he wasn't building a replica of a Ferrari. So he made, instead of a V6, he made a V8. And back then, Formula One's maximum capacity was 1.5 liters. So he put a 1.5 liter, 90 degree V8, actually a handsome little engine, just not developed, obviously. And they put it in this chassis that was designed by Alfonso Galvani. Not a good looking car. Really, they, they had all these ideas and then they kind of hung aluminum sheet metal on it and whatever shape that took. So the original <laughs> design of it is really clunky. They're building it, by the way, in this shed. And when they finished it, when they wanted to take it testing it, they hadn't got the factory wasn't done yet. The story goes is that they didn't fit through the door. So they had to take out a wall. And like anybody, like you hear stories of guys building kit cars in their homes and can't get them out. Same thing, right? Here's a professional Formula One team. They can't get their car out. So they hack out a wall and they test it on the city streets. And then they take it to an airport and finally to Monza to go drive it. And it's not, it's not good. It's not good. It doesn't have its debut until December of 1962, so nobody's even really seen it. And when they do, they have a huge party in Bologna, and a great story from that is that Keedy wanted to make it as long a wheelbase as possible for a couple of reasons. A long wheelbase is a stable wheelbase uh, at speed. So it was longer than the regular Formula One car and wheelbase. It also allowed the driver to lay down flat. Now that was the latest thing. The British cars, the BRMs and Lotuses were getting the guys lower and lower. The lower you can lay the guy down, the lower the car is. 
Keaty wasn't a huge fan of it, but he kind of was like, this is the way things are going. So they had really low, really long. At the debut, some of the journalists were like, that looks like a really long wheelbase. And Keaty's like, nah, it's just a regular, you know, regular old Formula One wheelbase, pulls out a tape measure and measures it in front of them and shows them. The trick was, it was a fake tape measure that was marked so that it read regular length when actually it was longer. So they were already cheating. I love that stuff. So they've got a Formula One car. It's 19, end of 1962. They've spent a year. They spent a ton of money. They still don't have anything to really show for it. They don't have any drivers. So this was a real coup. Who do they get to drive this car? Um, and there were people that were interested. Um, Sterling Moss actually stepped up when he had heard about the, the, the formation of the team. Now, Sterling Moss the greatest driver who never won a championship. He was interested, but then got injured at Goodwood later that year, and that ended his career. So that never happened. But what did happen was they got Phil Hill and Giancarlo Baghetti. Now, Phil Hill, Ferrari driver, Baghetti, Ferrari driver, they had had it with Ferrari as well. They saw the team that had taken them to the world championship, and they're like, well, that's the team that I got to go with. So they signed Phil Hill, world champion Phil Hill, to this unknown tiny little team. Now, Phil Hill is probably one of the greatest drivers of all time. He was so good on cars. Uh, it was probably a really wise choice because he had great mechanical sympathy for vehicles and he could keep them in one piece. So at the same time that this is happening, right, they, they, they're pushing the car out the wall, they, they're also building the street car because I want to kind of keep that in context. Before we even see the Formula One car race, the 2500 GT is displayed, I believe, in April of 1963 at the Geneva Auto Show. And it is a huge hit. The 2500 GT uses the same V8 that the Formula One car uses, except it's a little bit bigger. It's a two and a half liter. Now, that was specifically done to make sure that it wasn't over three liters because that would have competed directly with Ferrari at Le Mans kind of an idea. So they kept the two and a half liters. It was a gorgeous car. Everybody loved it. And more importantly, the second production mid-engine car ever built. Now the first one was the Rene Bonnet, which eventually became a Matra French car. But this was just absolutely stunning. Now, Scaglione designed the body. Alimano built it in Turin. It looks a lot, you might notice, like a 250 LM, and the Ferrari 250 LM came a few years later. This was groundbreaking stuff. It was a mid-engine supercar in 1963, and it was gorgeous. I keep saying that because I still think it is one of the most beautiful cars. When you see it in person, you can see the proportions and the use of stainless steel and chrome to highlight parts of it. Just absolutely brilliant. That car makes a splash and they've got to start building it. And that's Bizzarini's side of it. Bizzarini's already kind of like, mm, things are not great between him and Keaty. Uh, there's a lot of big egos here going on, especially at the head. So Billet, the one of the owners, really wanted to be president. So did Count Volpe. And they went head to head. Now, this happens in 19, the end of 1962, right before they debut the Formula One car. Volpe, comes out and says this. You'll excuse me if I read it so I can quote him directly. We give champions of the steering wheel the means to kill themselves. I give up. He who builds Formula One cars is a killer. Now that's not great PR for guys who are building a Formula One car. What had happened, his good friend Ricardo Rodriguez, one of the Rodriguez brothers, was killed in a horrible accident. And Volpe was like, I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, again, he's a young kid, he's 24. And he's like, mm, no, I'm done with racing. And he wanted to shut down the Serenissima and he wanted to shut down things. And he wanted, he didn't want much to do with ATS after that. Now that hacked off Billy because Billy's like, you didn't mention us at all. It, when he did all these announcements, it sounded like he owned, Volpe owned the company. Eventually Billy in early 1963 buys out Volpe and Ortino and owns the team himself. So there's already kind of discord at the top. There's discord internally between Chidi and Bezzarini. 
you can see where this is going. So they've got two cars, two directions they're trying to go in simultaneously, they're trying to fight two fronts on Ferrari. So the, the street car is under development. It's been debuted. They're figuring it out. It's really just a prototype. Now the Formula One car has got to go racing. Now, this is fun. If you excuse me, I'm going to use my notes, okay? Um, so the first race of the season is Monaco, and they miss it. Car is not ready. It's, it's again, it's still a very rudimentary car. They built it literally in nine months from writing on the back of, apparently they wrote the design of the back of a cigarette pack, and <laughs> from that cigarette pack to a running Formula One car, nine months. So they finally get their first races in June in Spa. Now, they miss the Friday practice because they got in traffic in Belgium. And they had to come in the back of the track. They get there just at the end. Phil Hill gets two laps and Baghetti gets one. And that's it. That was their practice. And this car's, again, never been at Spa. Spa is a long, fast, brutal course. It is a car, it is going to put a car through all its paces. This is not the place you want to shake down a brand new car, for sure, at those speeds. So you can see where this is going. Hill qualifies 10 seconds off the pole time. Baghetti qualifies 39 seconds off the pole time. And Baghetti goes out early, his gearbox fails. Then Hill comes in, his car is overheating, then his gearbox fails. And which is interesting because they had a Coletti six-speed gearbox, which really should have been a known quantity. Like they got something that they knew worked, the Coletti gearbox, and that's the part that gave up on them. Uh, they did have to modify it for their engine, so some of those modifications might have weakened it. Later that month, they go to Zandvoort. Jim Clark sets the qualifying time of 131. John Surtees, 133. Hill, 140. And then Baghetti at 149. They're starting to close the gap, which is really interesting. Um, now, this is the time, you got to remember, of, of Graham Hill, of Bruce McLaren, of Jack Brabham, of Dan Gurney, of all these legends are all racing legendary cars, BRMs and Lotuses. It, 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 to, have, to have to slide in to that era with a brand new car, whew, I wouldn't have wanted to done it. They get out and Hill comes in with a broken shock and then Baghetti is brought in as a precaution because I think his car is going to break to make sure he doesn't die. Now remember, these cars, there's no downforce, there's no wings. They are literally just a glorified kind of cigar <laughs> on four wheels, and that's it. It was a very dangerous time, so it was a smart thing to bring a car in if you knew something was going to fail. So they're out of Zandvoort. They take off, and they don't go to the British Grand Prix. They don't go to the French Grand Prix. They're working on the car. They're like, okay, it's ready. Let's go to Germany. They're going to go to the Norschleif. Now, that's 172 turns. Well, their truck and transporters driving over the Alps, and in Austria, a wheel comes off, and it crashes, and they fix it, <laughs> get up on its side, and bring it in. They work all night. Both the cars are unusable, and they can't race. So they don't race in Germany. Now, I, I'm not saying this happened, but... You know, if this were a movie, I'd put in like, you know, the guys going like, you know, it's a, it would be a horrible thing if your wheel fell off your truck. I'm not saying it does, but it'd be horrible if your wheel fell off. Just saying. So was there shenanigans going on against ATS? Probably. But, you know, that's all conjecture. Fun conjecture, but just conjecture. Now, they finally get their act together in September of 1963 and go to Monza, the home race, the Italian Grand Prix. Monza at the time has amazingly huge banked corner, which allowed tremendous speeds. And it had been raining and it was, it was a bad winter. In fact, they sent a cop car up there to see if the cop car could go through. And apparently it was so rough, the cop car was like, nope. So they canceled that part of the track. And they also limited the field to 20 because of the weather. Surtees in the Ferrari, Right, so home race, he's the one who's on pole at a 137. Hill's a 142. He's only th five seconds off pole now, which is great. Baghetti doesn't make it. He gets cut for time because he comes in 21st and only 20 drivers. Now, this is, I love stories like this. So 15 minutes before the race starts, 
some of the other cars aren't ready. Some of the top 20 cars aren't ready and they back out. They come over to Baghetti and 15 minutes before the race starts and goes, get your car ready, you're going out. And you can just see like Baghetti wearing his suit with a cocktail and a cigarette and be like, ah, you know, I'm gonna watch a hill drive the car, it'll be beautiful, it'll be wonderful. What, what, what? Oh, you want me to race? Okay, let's go. And you know, just hopped in the car. <laughs> Off to the grid they go, 15 minutes before the race. Now, during the race, one of my favorite repairs of all time in Formula One happens. Phil Hill's racing. Both the cars are doing pretty well. Phil Hill comes in, and for a fuel stop, I believe, and the alternator's on fire. So Billy, that not, not the engineer, not Keedy, or not one of the guys, Billy, the, head of the, the owner of the team, comes over with a hammer and smashes the alternator <laughs> until it goes out. And then tells Hill to drive on the battery until it, it fails. Just keep driving. It's the Italian Grand Prix. Keep going. So he does. And what was interesting was that the smashing of the alternator apparently fixed the problem they were having with their Lucas ignition and allowed them to get another 1,000 RPM out of the engine. Even though Hill started really far back, he moved up in the field. And Hill comes in 11th. And Baghetti finishes the race and comes in 13th. This is huge. And more importantly, they're the only Italian cars to finish. So Ferrari's cars fail. They are, for a small period of time, the Italian heroes. They finished the Italian Grand Prix. They saved the might of Italy. Good for you, them. Here comes ATS. They're going to beat Ferrari someday. No. So <laughs> this is the end of the European arm. Now they're going to come and bring their beautiful car to the United States, to Watkins Glen. Jim Clark at this point had already won the championship by points in the Lotus. So it was just kind of just get the cars out there and run. Hill qualifies 16th, Baghetti qualifies 20th. They switch from carburetors to Lucas Injection to back to carburetors. They're trying to find everything. A half a lap in, Baghetti fails. Five laps in, Hill fails, both with an oil pump. Now, that, I guess that shows you that they probably had the same exact engine, the same problem, but Phil Hill was able to get four and a half laps more out of that car than Baghetti. Hill was just fantastic. So after Glenn, they take the engines and send them back to Italy to get tuned up to figure out what's wrong. The team drives from Watkins Glen, they bring everything down, fly down to Mexico. Now Mexico, this was the first year it was officially on the Formula One calendar. And Mexico is at a really high altitude. It's over 7,000 feet. And even today, modern Formula One cars have an issues driving there at that altitude. The air is thin, cars overheat, is a lot of issues. So you can imagine what these older cars, they were trying to jet in carburetors and figure out how to make them run at that altitude. All the teams are working through the days before Everybody's getting their cars ready, except for ATS. Why? Because their engines were still in Italy. They don't arrive till the night before practice. And to add insult to injury, there's a huge thunderstorm, which knocks out the electrical grid in that part of Mexico. So they're installing their engines overnight with flashlights and, according to the stories, candles. Candles in a garage full of racing fuel sticking <laughs> engines in the back of their cars, which, by the way, the cars were really loose, and Hill kept complaining about rigidity, so they kept welding bars in the back, and the only way to get the engine out was to cut the bars, take the engine out, and to put it back in, you had then weld bars back in around it, like entomb it in the back of the car. So they're putting these cars together overnight, in the dark, in the rain, by candlelight. So... You're hoping, you know, there's going to be some heroic end to this. Like, they're going to win the race. No. Hill qualifies 18th. Baghetti, 21st. The cars aren't ready. These cars are not ready. Um, Baghetti goes out early. He was driving. He had issues. Something broke. This broke. Finally, the organizers of the race just set, brought the car in. They're like, just get that car off the track. And Hill, this was great, goes from 18th to eighth place over 41 laps. So it's, the car is starting to show some potential. 
and then his suspension breaks and he is out. Now they don't go to the South African Grand Prix because they are done. The car is done. And, but not in the mind of Carlo Chidi. Carlo Chidi keeps working on it. And he's, got, he's ready to go into 1964. He's figured a way of getting 215 horsepower out of this V8 instead of 190. He's still moving on his brain, but the Formula One car really not, not gonna happen. So this is kind of where ATS starts falling apart. Um, the streetcar, getting back to the reason for the video, <laughs> was the 2500 GT. The 2500 GT was going to be the counterpart to the Formula One car. It was the chicken and the egg problem that came out immediately. The sports car, the 2500 GT, was supposed to, sales of it, were supposed to support the Formula One effort. Why the Formula One effort winning helps sells the street cars, and that's the way it worked at Ferrari. And Billet, who was now funding the whole company, wanted to see a profit somewhere or the possibility of a profit. And not, it wasn't happening. The 2500 GT was an exceptional car, well received at the Geneva Auto Show. People loved it, but I think they were waiting to see how the Formula One car went because it, well, they were kind of the same engine. And also they wanted to see how the 2500 GT was in racing because it was supposed to be a sports car and a race car. So the GT was beautifully appointed inside, leather interior, had power windows, which was immensely unusual at the time. My favorite feature of that car is the fuel tanks are in the sills, are in the rockers on either side of the car. So there's 35 gallons of fuel down there, which engineering wise is tremendously smart because you've got the fuel centralized in the car and really low down. The balance of this thing must have been exquisite with the V8 pushed really far forward in the rear, you know, really centralized mass, just beautiful engineering. And this was way before anybody else had done anything like this. Nothing looked like it either because engines were in the front. So you had big bonnets, the, like the, 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 the beautiful and gorgeous, and I won't argue one of the great cars, Ferrari 250 GTO, looked like an antique next to this car. You had a short little hood because you didn't have the engine up front and you had the high back and a nice tight proportions. It is what a modern supercar looks like these days. Started with the 2500 GT. That's why I think it's so important. That's why I think it's so beautiful. But they weren't selling many of them. They had built the factory to build, I think, 10 a year. And they were hoping to build 20 in 63 and 64 to get things going. We know, we think, maybe the author of the book, not even quite sure that they built 12 chassis. Uh, we know that there's six, there's three GTSs and three GTs. You'll see them at Amelia or you'll see them at Pebble Beach. Um, they, they do wonderfully in competition, obviously. But if you ever get a chance to see one, I recommend it. Seeing it in the flesh is a lot different than the photographs. It is a beautiful car. And you'll now be the, one of the few people on the lawn who actually know what it is. So the differences between the two cars, if you're interested, the GTS was the racing version. So it was an aluminum body as opposed to the steel body of the GT. You can tell some visual differences. The GT had bumpers, the GTS did not. The GT had a little vent window in the front so you could flick your cigarettes. The GTS had sliding windows for racing. There were visual differences. There was one with louvers in the back, which was really trick looking. They tried all kinds of different designs and evolutions of it. And it would have, imagine it would have evolved. And remember, this is before the mid-engine Mura. This is before the Dino. This is years before all of that. This thing was a spaceship. It was fantastic. Um, now, they did try to race it. They tried to show that the GTS was a capable race car. So uh, story goes that they were testing it at Monza and they were going to take it to Le Mans. <laughs> and some more ATS luck. The story goes that they got to the border and the car got impounded and they didn't get to France in time to get the car classified and qualified and it never ran at Le Mans. What they did run at was the Targa Florio. That in Sicily, is one of the most brutal races in history. And you should look it up, it's just, it's fantastic. And I'll do a video on it someday because I'm Sicilian, so I should do a Sicilian race video. But until then, they're really long, circuitous, 
kind of crazy courses on city streets through Sicily. And in that period, the, I think the racetrack was 45 miles long and the race was 10 laps. And it wasn't a closed course, so you couldn't learn it. Like you could learn the ring and it's closed. You had to learn the city streets. And they said you had to do like 60, 70 laps of this, learn it. So, I mean, it was amazing. They show up and they've got two cars. The first car out on the first lap, it's got issues. The second car, that made it three laps and was actually leading its class when it had ignition failure and it, it was out. So they didn't do anything at the Florio. It never made its mark in racing like they had hoped it was going to be. And there was no funding. Billy was like, I'm, I'm done with this. And which is unfortunate because I, I think it could have been one of the great cars. Porsche won the, those years um, with their rear engine cars. I mean, that was, the, that was the future, it was coming. So they couldn't sell them, nobody was buying them. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's stories that uh, at some point they were selling them to each other, that um, they would sell them to a cousin, so they would show us something on the books. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I think it's funny. They did sell one to Bill Mitchell, the vice president of General Motors, because he admired it so much of its design that he had to have one. So they sent one over to the United States, um, which I believe was their test car. Like they didn't have many cars. So like whatever they could get bodged together, if somebody was gonna pay for it, they were gonna send it off. Unfortunately, Bill A, the industrialist, was like, this isn't working out for me. This is just costing me a ton of money. Um, nothing's really moving. The, the Formula One car is not winning. It's not selling the street car. The street car is not winning. It's not selling itself. Uh, the house of the Red Dragon, which is what they called it, was time to shut its doors. And which isn't a bad thing because, you know, the closing of the door is the opening of another. The opportunity happened for everybody that worked there. Billy and Kitty were approached by Alfa Romeo. Alfa Romeo wanted kind of a racing arm the way Renault had Alpine and Fiat had Abarth. Um, they wanted their own little thing. So Kitty put together Auto Delta. Auto Delta was the kind of hot rod racing division for Alfa Romeo. And they used a lot of what was left over in ATS to build that. And that led to, I mean, really probably one of the most beautiful cars of all time, the Alfa Romeo 33 Stradale. Now, this is essentially an evolution of the 2500 GT. It uses the same, really the same motor. Kitty brought that V8 up and developed it and developed it and developed it till it became that motor for the 33, which was just, oh, again, a car you have to see in person. Absolutely stunning, so important, and one of the most beautiful designs of all time. So Kitty moves on with them, that's fantastic. Bizzarini, you can't keep a talent like that down. He leaves ATS a little earlier and starts his own company, he ends up making the V12 for Lamborghini, the famous V12, which lasted from the 350 GT all the way to the Murcielago. That's the same V12, essentially, that Ed Bolian's driving around in, and his Mercies is the engine that Bizzarini designed back in the 60s. So he designed the engine for Lamborghini, then he gets involved with ESO and helps make the ESO Griffo. Then he, starts, he makes his own cars, the Bizzarinis, like the 5300 GT, which is another stunning, amazing car. So he has a rich and wonderful life. Uh, Scaglioni, of course, goes on to design more amazing cars. All of them go off in their own directions. ATS gets shut down, the factory gets broken into parts. A, a little thing that I forgot to mention, Billet, used his stocking factories to help build Formula One parts, Formula One car parts, before they got the factory done. So he was a real genius moving stuff around, but they broke up the factory to build different things. Part of it, I think, actually did stay with Auto Delta. Um, and that was it. They ATS kind of vaporized. Count Volpe would go on to get back into racing. Serenissima would go on to build some cars and do some amazing things with them. So everybody, it's kind of like the end of of uh, Animal House, right? <laughs> like They all go on to do some really cool things and we're all happy for them, but it was unfortunate that ATS itself wasn't that great thing that it could have been. It was a lot of opportunity that wasn't met with success. So not everything has a happy Hollywood ending. I'm sorry this video doesn't have an amazing ending, 
But that's it. It was such an amazing time in car racing and car building history that you could even do this. You could, you could even try to attempt this. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've enjoyed this bit of history. Um, I look forward to your comments. Please, if you're digging these, like and subscribe, tell your friends. I will continue trying to do these histories. They take a lot of work, so I can only do one like a month or so, but uh, I will continue to put them in. Please give me your suggestions down below. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.